When Americans were sent by court order to AA meetings, many wondered if the oversized photos of Bill W. and Dr. Bob hanging on the walls were perhaps from the book of Revelation, the two witnesses that appear in the last days, or were they just the AA cult's leaders? Was this a fascist program? The two witnesses of Revelation were two olive trees and candlesticks that testify of Jesus. And these witnesses were very unpleasant, and no one didn't cringe when they were mentioned, and their dead bodies would lie in the street of the great city, quote, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, close quote, Revelation 11.8, King James Bible. The two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth with a question of whether the God of the earth is the same as the God of the universe. And the line about Sodom and Egypt said, where also our Lord was crucified. But that doesn't mean Jerusalem because it said where, quote, spiritually our Lord was crucified. The crucifixion had been in Jerusalem, not in Sodom or Egypt. So what would spiritual Egypt and Sodom mean? Egypt was all about olives, and Noah's dove brought back an olive leaf, and Gentiles were grafted into the olive tree, and olive trees were about children. Jeremiah eleven sixteen said, The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. King James Bible. Psalms 128.3 said, Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants around your table. Ibid. Olive oil was used for anointing, and King David wept on the Mount of Olives, and so did Jesus. And so if the two witnesses are about homosexuality and abortion, what are candlesticks? A candlestick is not the light, but something that supports the light that it might be seen, holding the light up to your face, in your face, and there's two of them. These lampstands point towards Jesus, and Zechariah 14 said, The Lord will stand on the Mount of Olives, and living water will flow from it. And while the two witnesses point towards Jesus, without Jesus, these two witnesses would have nothing to say. Every word, every line, every chapter and letter and verse in the Bible is about Jesus and his magnificent achievement. And the primary warning of the entire Bible is that God hates idolatry. It's not so much that God likes being worshipped, since it doesn't tell us very much about that, except for some instructions on how to grow, how to grow and cook food. But the huge point in the whole Bible is how much God hates idolatry. What precisely is idolatry? Idol idolatry means doing and saying things with the intention of getting God to do something in our own image, something different than his own ways and his own works. Idolatry is trying to influence God, and some may think it's their job to prevent people from sinning, but that's idolatry. Every person gets to work out their own salvation because it's between them and God, not between a pastor and God or a priest and God, and not between them and us, but between each and their Creator. The commandment is to share our own experience, strength, and hope and let it go with that. If we worship our own selves, our own minds and perceptions, we may think we know better than God, but that's idolatry. And when we're doing it, it doesn't feel good and feels like work, and it feels like work done in bondage. Idolatry takes effort, not praise, and when we're telling God what to do, we don't feel good. But when we're thanking Him and walking or going fishing with Him, we are truly happy. Jesus is the only one who can handle the two witnesses, not us. And the crucifixion taught us that we make terrible judges, that humans are pitiful excuses for saints, and that we desperately need direct guidance from the Holy Spirit, a willing heart, and a humble mind, or we'd murder God's own son in cold blood. If the Jewish Messiah were a drunk, the local leaders in 30 AD were certain that the Romans would come clean out the stinking Jewish religion, but good for once and all. 
Heidegger's central question, who cares, becomes the most important question of all at the beginning and at the end, and is the trumpet call that demands an immediate response, the final roll call of conscience. To the Heideggerian phenomenologist, instead of God returning to save the earth, we strive to save God so that we may return to the earth, and in so doing, the primal basis of equality is revealed in the inescapable fact that we are all powerless in the face of alcoholism. The danger of technology is not the atomic bomb, but putting people into groups to which they do not belong, and it could be that Jesus meant that if we could quit for three days, we would become a new man. Because we're all God's kids and he approaches us in a personal way unique to each, we're told in AA that it is okay to believe in a God who can help us find four-leaf clovers. God is willing to listen to the quietest person in the room just for practice, and if God were an impersonal force instead of a person, we could tap into it and use it for our own ends as though it were a barrel of whiskey. If God were something other than a person, we could turn God on and off like a faucet or conjure a magic formula that would bend him to our will. Instead, we must learn to get along with him and to be of whatever service he offers us. Does this mean that in order to know the Lord you must get stoned and drunk and let people spit on you? Well, the only answer according to the principle of phenomenological philosophy is yes, so that Shema becomes, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one too. Deuteronomy 6 4. The word one in Deuteronomy's Shema is Strong's 259, the same word that also appears in Genesis 322 as meaning, quote, one of us. The Lord God said, Since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out, take from the tree of life, eat, and live forever. Genesis 322 Christian Standard Bible. The Apostle Mark quoted Jesus quoting this Deuteronomy Shema, and Mark wrote in Greek and used the Greek word Epsilon Iota Sigma, or Strong's 1520 in, quote, the Lord God is one, close quote, that meant belonging to or alike. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Mark 1229, King James Bible. The word for one, used in John 10.30 when he wrote, I and the Father are one, was again the Greek word Strong's 15.20, implying that both Jesus and the Father are alike. And at the end of the Bible story in the book of Revelation, the new Jerusalem had twelve gates, and the walls had twelve foundations, and Ezekiel's vision of the new temple in the new Israel had an altar that was twelve cubits by twelve cubits, and there are twelve stars around Mary's crown, and the tree of life had twelve kinds of fruit in Revelation 22, and the tree was, quote, for the healing of the nations, close quote. There were twelve tribes of Israel, and when Moses set up the tabernacle, they donated twelve silver plates and twelve silver bowls, and they laid out twelve golden spoons, but the Catholic version said twelve golden cups. And then they burnt up twelve bulls, twelve rams, and twelve goats, and it took them twelve days to gather up all this stuff, and then, quote, this was the dedication of the altar after that it was anointed, close quote, Numbers 788. Solomon had twelve officers over Israel, and when Elijah had to prove to Ahab that the Lord was real, he built the broken altar with twelve stones, and then Elijah made it rain, and when God gave Job the where were you when I laid the foundations of the world speech, he asked if Job could bring forth the twelve signs of the zodiac. The diseased woman with the issue of blood had been sick for twelve years when Jesus healed her, and right after that he raised a girl from the dead, who was twelve years old, and Jesus told everyone to keep it a secret. And when he fed the crowd with the loaves and fishes, there were twelve baskets of food left over, and he'd been twelve years old when he spent three days in the temple, astonishing the priests. When Jesus was told that his friend Lazarus was sick, he'd waited for two days before going to see Lazarus who had died in the meantime, and the apostles warned Jesus not to go because the Jews were out to kill him. And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? 
If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. John eleven nine through 11 King James Bible. When the Jews had Jesus arrested, Jesus told the guards that God could send him twelve legions of angels, and when Paul was arrested in 58 AD, he'd been in Jerusalem for twelve days after going up to Jerusalem for the last time. And Paul had gone back to Jerusalem to prove that he was a good and faithful Jew, but they dragged him out of the temple, and Paul was rescued by a Roman guard. St. Paul was given the choice of being heard at trial in Jerusalem or being given a trial in Rome, and he chose Rome because the trial would be more fair, and so they went on their adventure at sea so Paul could appeal to Caesar. In Rome, Paul was given a pleasant house to live in where he could be visited by people for two years, for the two years it took to get to trial, and he wrote many nice long letters to the Christian churches because he was an inspired Jewish scholar and he was acquitted by Nero in 63 AD, and then Paul traveled around for a few more years until Nero changed his mind and killed Paul. St. Francis of Assisi, who was Bill W.'s patron saint, said, quote, Since the day of my conversion, I have never been well. Close quote. Pass it on, page 302. All along, Jesus preferred to be an anonymous person rather than the Messiah, a title other people gave to him. And Jesus didn't make the sacrifice of denying himself alcohol, but made the sacrifice of allowing people to treat him badly before and after death for enjoying it. Jesus didn't want to be a king, and when the crowds called out for him to be crowned their king after he'd fed them with the loaves and fishes, he escaped across the lake without using a boat, because while they didn't understand a whole lot about what he was teaching, they certainly wanted more loaves and fishes. Drinking is a technological solution applying a chemical to the body and to the mind in order to manipulate one's environment. Under the influence, you're no longer you and have lost your authenticity. So under the transforming principle of technology, you have become just another drunk. And getting sober is not just a spiritual awakening as much as it is being able to see how God sees you. Authentic sobriety means that every person is responsible for their own getting sober and that if you can't stay sober, you might as well die trying. Decara is, quote, the return or the recovery, meant to restore, but not meant to begin again, and it requires a will to health. So asking whether one is born an alcoholic or if a person becomes one, the proper response is that once you learn to drink like a drunk, there's no going back to being an ordinary drinker. After that line has been crossed, getting sober is not a getting right, but a flight over the top, not a becoming normal, but a transition into a superhumanity, a being with the spiritual world. Becoming an overman is a daily process, not a permanent transformation. And to Bill W., doing what is necessary to stay sober is, quote, the proper use of the will. Alcoholics Anonymous, page 85. During Hitler's war, the world took up arms in opposition to the phrase will to power that the Nazis had been using in 1935. And while the will can be thought of as something selfish or pushy, Heidegger used the German word meaning motivation or inclination. Having a will to power implied having a conscious choice, not merely an ordinary will to have. And in phenomenology, a will to power could not be towards an other, but only towards one's own self, the will to self-overcoming. In drinking, do we have a will to power or a will to be powerless? Thereafter, is wanting to be sober like a will to sobriety? And is getting sober a matter of willpower? What is the difference between a desire to stop drinking and a willingness to be sober? Is it a will to power that keeps one from wanting to be so, 
become sober? Or is it a will to power when one admits that we just can't help ourselves anymore, that in our powerlessness we have been given the power to stay sober by continuing to realize our lack of power for staying sober? The primary tenet of AA is that no human power could relieve us of alcoholism. So having come to believe that God is and would, mustn't we also ask, how is he? If prayer were, if prayer is talking to God as though he were a person, one suggestion to AAs is that they ask their sponsor to keep them sober in the same tone and manner they are asking God. And if those words come out sounding like a spoiled child demanding something they neither understand nor deserve, it's time to work on their conception of God. Sobriety is a uniquely individual experience, a path each must follow on their own. And the AAs settled on God as you understand him, which did not mean that there is more than one God, but that there is more than one individual's understanding of him. A meeting is a gathering place, a clearing space where individuals can find themselves and where only the truly faithful believe in a desire to stop drinking. The difference between a good and a bad meeting is whether you're there to learn or to teach, and whether you are there to get or have come to give. Christians say without sacrifice there is no salvation, but you can't sacrifice something you never liked much in the first place, and that's what Lent is all about. A practice run before a practice run before the ultimate Passover, and sobriety without the real God is just not good enough for anyone who has truly come to know drugs and alcohol. Thus God initiates what man is powerless to provide, his own salvation. All the moral, pa moral powers of the individual and all the social forms of the community will be proved inadequate, for God's salvation in Christ is the only possible plan of man's redemption. World of Flame by Billy Graham, page 65. The task of thinking about alcoholism is a scientific enterprise, as the big book writers wanted it to be, a thought opera of facts running like a finely tuned machine, thought paths composed just the same as mathematical formulas with each par paragraph true to the next in a Matryoshka doll of clear and sober thinking. More than revisionist, it is recoverist, and as we reach the end, the moral of the story is that you can find God at your own kitchen table. Thanks to Hitler, and in the best Nazi tradition, we have discovered that a superman is a sober drunk, and thanks to Heidegger, we now know that in the darkest danger lies the rescue. If they take a look at reality, it would mean only one thing, no alcohol. A greater threat does not exist for alcoholics. The Booze Battle by Ruth Maxwell, New York Henry Holt and Company, 1976, page 113. To quit is to cue it without the you, because it has now become an honor to be in an honor, so may God bless you and keep you until then, and to thine own self be true. St. Augustine wrote in his Confessions, Late have I loved thee, O beauty so ancient and so new. Late have I loved thee. I was looking for thee out there, and I threw myself, deformed as I was, upon those well-formed things which thou hast made. Thou wert with me, yet I was not with thee. Thou didst send forth thy frag fragrance, and I drew in my breath, and now I pant for thee. I have tasted, and now I hunger and thirst. Thou didst touch me, and I was inflamed with desire for thy peace. When I shall cleave to thee with all my being, sorrow and toil will no longer exist for me, and my life will be alive, wholly filled with being wholly filled with thee. The Essential Augustine Confessions X twenty seven to eight edited by Vernon J. Burke, New York, Mentor Omega Books, the New American Library, nineteen sixty four, page one forty eight. The oldest city in America was named after St. Augustine, and from his writing we must admit that God knows not only our hearts and minds, but also our spirit. The people of the book known as Jews may think God is pleased if they are good, but it's not about being good. It's about embracing the mystery and enjoying the show. God has an incomparable historical perspective, since history, after all, is his story, and God must stay anonymous, 
or he stops being God because then he would become what Heidegger called ready to hand, something malleable and changeable like the gods of Chinese Buddhism or something like a shot of opium used by anyone except for people who are dying. God is a triangle in a circle, all three manifestations in one. And while those who don't believe in God may do things we see as bad behavior, they make God laugh, and that must be enough for us. To God we are silly, limited humans doing what we think is best at the time, like Jochen Piper crossing that bridge at Stavelot, or Fremont not listening to old Bill Williams, or Monty trying to do what he thought was best in order to restore the only way of life he had ever known, and of course there's the alcoholic who thinks that this time it will work, that one more drink will finally quench that eternal thirst that only the deity himself can know. This brings us to a final question, and that is, what is the difference between a character defect and a mental illness? The answer is that Bill had this to say about paid, mi paid missionaries and why he didn't want them. Now it is an undoubted fact that professionalism in spiritual matters has too often limited the spread of real understanding and practical application. The modern world has little time for paid emissaries of God, notwithstanding a deep yearning for the rock of ages. Pass it on, page 323. As the heart panteth after the running brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Psalms 42.1 King James Bible. The good, the good news <coughs> is that everyone gets into heaven and they download your brain into a speck of dust and you get to float around for all eternity watching videos of everyone else's life and if you're good they cut out the bad parts of yours. It's not just the pictures, but we get to know how they felt at the time and every once in a while they make us vote on something. And to get into the front row seats, it's not what you do that gets you that special place, but what they've done to you. And the difference between heaven and hell is whether you're laughing with us or burning in shame. From Stavelot to Liège was 20 miles as the bird flies, and halfway from Stavelot where Piper crossed the fateful bridge over the Amblev River, there was a cave at Belle Roche, ten miles up from where the Amblev flowed into the Meuse at Liège. And in this Belle Roche cave near Spremont, Human remains were found estimated to be from a half million years ago, the oldest known human habitation of the oldest known habitation of human beings in Europe. Those people had been living there on the Amblev near Spremont well before Belgium split into Austrasia and Neust Neustria when the Germans conquered Rome, and the name Spremont was described in records kept in the Abbey of Stavelot as meaning the mountain of the spear or the lance. The Mont part did not just mean mountain, but had implied something holy or sacred, and the Romans interpreted the Belgian word Mont as being mountain because Romans and Greeks worshipped their gods at the top of high hills and they knew the ancient Belgians thought Spremont was sacred, so the Romans had translated the word as Mount Spear or Spremont. The Orange Book said that the Somme River is the only river in Europe that has not changed from before the glacial ages had redesigned the face of Europe, which is why so much evidence of early man had been found along its banks, and that Psalm was not only a crucial battleground, f battleground for Henry VIII and his revolutionary Church of England, but the Psalm was also the largest and costliest battle of the Great War when the British were fighting the Germans on French soil. The first day of the Battle of the Somme was the worst day in the history of the British Army, and that battle was where tanks were used for the first time. And few British troops had ever reached the front lines, after almost 20,000 of them were killed in action, and in the end, even though the men had advanced a full six miles, they had failed to seize any of their objectives. The Urantia book said, that the psalm had been the place where the Vikings had finally subdued the blue men by using milita superior military strategy. 
and the Vikings had then absorbed the best of their genetic stock, and the Viking hero from those invasions had been named Thor, and he had directed that all captives deemed to be inferior were to be anonymously drowned in the river Somm. Eons after the Vikings had gone on to sail up every river in Russia, the Red Army arrived in Germany in February of 1945, and the Project Risa tunnels were overrun, where 350,000 cubic feet of earth had been excavated by tens of thousands of concentration camp prisoners. The huge complex of Project Risa tunnels 50 miles northeast of Prague were cut out of solid rock underneath several castles, including Furstenstein Castle in Silesia and Jedlinka Palace in Tannhausen, and the tunnels had been designed to store golden Jewish treasure, and one-third of the tunnels had been finished with concrete walls, and most of them were accessible by railroad. Project Risa would have been a success until the Americans interfered with the plan, and the Jew communists had coughed up a lot of treasure. Twelve thousand kilos of gold and silver wedding rings, six thousand gold pocket watches, 13,000 gold crucifixes, 40,000 Russian gold coins, 15,000 Austrian gold coins, 5,000 American gold coins and British gold sovereigns, 5,000 kilos of gold scrap, and 5,000 kilos of dental gold with parts of teeth and jawbones still attached. There were also piles of cash, including $300,000 in U.S. gold notes, along with countless kilos of jewelry, precious stones, and heirloom tableware, all counted up following the final entry of D plus 335 on Ike's official calendar marking the end of the war. London, Friday, March 3, 1944. The Prime Minister has taken the position that either the RAF Bomber Command should be independent of the Supreme Commander's control, but to work in conjunction with him and his forces, or only a part of Bomber Command would be under his control. The PM wanted to conduct his own private war if he chose. Ike told the PM at one of the two meetings last week that if the British insisted on this less-than-all-out effort for Overlord, then he would, quote, simply have to go home, close quote. The Americans, he maintained, now had a much larger air force in the UK than even the British, have thrown all their air force into the Supreme Command, and he could not face the U.S. Chiefs of Staff if the British hold out this important striking force. Ike did not care if the PM wished to hold Coastal Command under separate control, but he insisted that Bomber Command be directed through the organization of the Supreme Commander, as envisioned by the directive of the Combined Chief. Chiefs, my three years with Eisenhower, the personal diary of Captain Harry C. Butcher, page 498. Only months before Hitler's war broke out, officers from the German nobility had sat at the same dinner tables with Brit British royalty, and they had all attended the same parties and toasted each other's superior intelligence along with their knowledge of hunting and they took turns complimenting the servants, while the Americans knew that intelligence had a lot to do with dry socks and hot food. Britain had wanted to use Hitler to squash the Russians, and Hitler had great success right up until Dunkirk, when he was giving, given an ultimatum that he could either take Britain by force and face the unpleasant wrath of a resentful population, or he could agree to the British request for regime change in Russia after which the King of England would make Hitler a knight of the realm and become his best friend, and the assassination attempts against Hitler did not commence until the Germans began to fail against the Russian army. The officer corps of the British army was comprised of the elite who were trained at the same schools attended by the nobility, and Kim Philby had been born in India in 1912 where his British father was stationed and Kim Philby grew up playing with Indian children, and he spoke Hindi before he spoke English, and he learned to ride motorcycles from his Indian playmates. On his summer vacations, Kim Philby rode his motorcycle around Europe, and as a young man he thought that the Great War was fought to end all royalty. When Kim Philby was sent to school in England after growing up in India, 
He found the class consciousness quite distasteful, and Kim Philby did not fit in with the royal officers who had grown up learning the insider world of hunting skills and the mores of commanding servants and the art of administrating the affairs, administering the affairs of others for whom they had no personal concern. Up until the 60s, only 4% of British students went to college, while 26% of Americans went on to higher education, and there were fewer British college students in England than there were American college students of African descent in America. Class stratification in Britain, guaranteed by the lack of access to class strat class stratification in Britain was guaranteed by the lack of access to education, and during Hitler's war, these British officers just naturally followed Monty from disaster to disaster as though it were some kind of profound sporting contest conducted by the best modern warriors of their class of people. Kim Philby's father spoke seven languages and had been sent to Iraq as the finance minister who was in charge of Lawrence of Arabia's uprising against the Ottoman Turks. And Kim Philby's father had arrived in Baghdad five years after his wedding, where none other than Monty had been his best man. Kim Philby's father was put in charge of the payroll and expense account of the British Secret Service in Baghdad during the Great War, and he handled the extreme amounts of cash flowing through Iraq after the death of the Russian Tsar. The British were backing the Hashemites from Jordan, but Kim Philby's father preferred the Saudis. And after the Great War, Kim Philby's father was sent to Saudi Arabia, and he fell in love with all things Arabian, and began calling himself Abdullah, and started dressing like an Arab, and he took an Arab slave as a second wife behind his wife's back. And Kim Philby's father thought that the money coming from selling oil after the Great War was corrupting his beloved Arabs. In 1935, Kim Philby's father thought the Italians were the new Romans, and he was certain that Hitler would not invade in England, and everybody wanted to be Roman again in 1935. The Saudis would have a falling out with Kim Philby's father in 1955 because a British company had a contract for building them a palace, and Kim Philby's father told the Saudis that the palace was too Western. Many British agents would meld with the country to which they were posted, and that was called going native. And during the Great War, these wayward British agents made promises to the Arabs without authority, even though they believed at the time that they had that authority, and that those, and that those had been the exact promises they'd been sent to deliver. In the fallout after the war, many would feign desertion when the British government betrayed them, and it wasn't that these renegades despised England so much as it was that their lives had become seriously intertwined with the natives. When British policy turned out to be different than the given promises, they needed to defend themselves, and when, when the truth was usually that the British government was just house poor. Britain had always been at war with the uncivilized world, and they saw themselves as apart from the natives, as superior, based mainly on the technology of the English language, especially when it came to words committed onto paper, and this was precisely the danger in technology that Heidegger warned about. But what choice did the British have in the face of History Anonymous? Exile from the British court had been severe punishment because it meant having to learn a different language. And when the Americans captured the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, they put kegs of beer in the judge's chamber and turned the bench into a bar. Many had thought the great crash in 1929 had been a good thing because there were too many people like Bill W. showing up at their exclusive members-only clubs, and these newly rich didn't have the proper manners to go along with having so much money, and old money thought that poor people had no business getting ahead in the world where it was becoming increasingly difficult to find good servants since the Great War had destroyed the serving class. America had gotten into the Great War when Germany was winning, or Britain would not have had to pay back the lend-lease owed to the U.S. 
and the Owen plan of 1929 had been a $9 billion debt that would not be paid off until 1988. President Wilson had written his 14 points as though Germany deserved to be treated as a victor. However, the British screwed with the implementation of the 14 points in order to punish Germany, and Wilson s suffered a stroke in October of 1919 that left him paralyzed on his left side, and the stroke came three months after Germany had signed the Treaty of Versailles on the 28th of June, five years to the day after Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. President Wilson's wife became the de facto first woman president of the United States until the Republican candidate beat them out of a third term in the next election in November of 1920. The League of Nations came out of the peace negotiations born out of Wilson's vision after the Great War of an international group that could mediate disputes without having to resort to armed force and copies of the 14 points had been dropped behind enemy lines to the German troops and were delivered directly to the German leaders in person. When the lost battalion held and the Americans broke through the German lines, the British agreed to the armistice signed five weeks after the lost battalion was relieved, and Germany responded favorably to Wilson's request for the armistice because the 14 points were fair and just and treated Germany with respect. The American proposal had been delivered to the Kaiser right after the British had gotten the Americans to abandon their Metz effect. Metz offensive into the Argonne forests so the British could manage their Cambrai advance. And when the Americans took incredible losses in the Battle of Cambrai, General Pers Pershing had reported to President Wilson that fighting alongside the British was no longer acceptable. Two million Americans came over to France and built roads and docks and warehouses and hospitals and 1,000 miles of railroad tracks and thousands of miles of telegraph and telephone lines. It was during the last month of the Great War that the corporal from Tennessee, Mr. Alvin York, did his famous turkey shoot, and the turning point in the war had been when the Americans at Bellow Wood held off the Germans marching on Paris. They had been training for a new kind of fighting, to attack and keep on attacking, and take machine gun nests in spite of losses, and now they were doing it. In the few days of that battle, the Germans sent in seven divisions to stop the first division of the Americans, and when they failed, their leaders knew that the tide of war had turned. World's End, page 249 and 50. Kurt wasn't afraid that his friend might get physically hurt, for it was obvious that the British would be driven into the sea and the French would lose Paris long before the Americans could take any effective part in the war. But Kurt didn't want his friend's mind distorted and warped by the agents of British imperialism. These people who had grabbed most of the desirable parts of the earth now thought they had a chance to destroy the German fleet, build their Cape to Cairo Railroad, keep the Germans from building the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, and in every way thwart the efforts of a vigorous and capable race to find their place in the sun. World's End, page 247. The month after the Americans landed on the beach of Normandy, in Beaches of Normandy, in 1944, the meeting at Bretton Woods in July created an international monetary fund and an international bank so that London would no longer be the banking capital of the world, and the next month they would meet at Dumbarton Oats, Oaks to talk about creating the United Nations. The Fourteen Points had called for freedom of the seas and an end to secret treaties, and the League of Nations first met in Paris in January of 1920 and then moved to Geneva into a hotel named the National Hotel, but they renamed it the Palace v Wilson in President Wilson's honor. Due to enormous anti-aircraft fire on the 6th of June in 1944, most of the C-47s bringing the paratroopers to Normandy had taken diversionary action, so the Americans had been spread out far afield from the drop zones, and it had seemed a bad thing at the time, but because the drops were so scattered, the American paratroopers had survived the Germans who had been waiting for them. 
When the Vikings had landed on the beaches of Normandy in the year 911, it had been named after them as Northmandy, and the name Brittany came from the French Bretagne, or the land stolen by the English, although the French had first called it Armorica from a Celtic word meaning the land by the sea. The Higgins boats, designed in New Orleans from the for the Normandy landing, held thirty-six men each and could switch from forward to, rever to reverse at full power, and the Utah-bound Higgins boats, carrying the Americans, left from Plymouth Harbor. When our forces were moved to the takeoff areas on May 30, 1944, Leigh Mallory personally called on General Eisenhower to protest the use of the U.S. airborne forces using the term, quote, the futile slaughter of two fine divisions, close quote. In Eisenhower's book Crusade in Europe, he states, quote, Lay Mallory believed that the combination of unsuitable landing grounds and anticipated resistance was too great a hazard to overcome, close quote. Lay Mallory did not think that this was present in the British area, but he estimated that among the American outfits we would suffer some 70% losses in glider strength and 50% in parachute strength even before the airborne troops could land. Even today, more than 30 years later, I feel a fury rise in me when I realize that Lay Mallory was going to have us left behind and that all our American airlift would have been given to the British. On to Berlin, page 102 and 3. Instead of being stopped at the Normandy beaches, Hitler's plan had been to let the Americans march into Paris, then annihilate them with von Rundstedt's army waiting there in ambush. But Rommel had told von Rundstedt that air attacks could stop German ground forces, and Rommel described to him what had happened in North Africa, and von Rundstedt believed Rommel's insistence that the Americans needed to be stopped on the Normandy beaches. However, Hitler held firm about the Paris plan and was not worried about what was called air superiority because he had all the targets worked out with the British and at the time the Americans were subordinate to British bomber command. Hitler's West Wall had been the greatest construction project in history and was meant to keep out the enemies of Germany, specifically the British, and they used a million tons of steel and a million tons of timber and three million rolls of barbed wire and five million cubic yards of concrete, and in comparison the Hoover Dam had used 3.25 million cubic yards of concrete, a little over half that much. The defenses on the Normandy beaches had been just for show, von Rundstedt secretly told Rommel, and the Atlantic Wall defenses were intended only for propaganda purposes in order to get the Americans to invade so they could be taken out as soon as they had almost reached Paris. Rommel's efforts to build adequate defenses for the Atlantic Wall had met steadfast opposition from Berlin, and Rommel had no authority to fortify the Normandy beaches until January of 1944, but in that short time, Rommel had managed to install millions of mines and scores of tank traps, including Rommel's asparagus, and he had to promise Hitler that the work would be completed by the 1st of May. But by D-Day on the 6th of June, Rommel told Hitler that the defenses were only 20% complete. The invasion date for the 1st of May had been agreed to at the Quebec meeting between Churchill and Roosevelt on the 17th of August in 1943, and the main issue at the Quebec meeting had been Churchill wanting the Americans to share with the British what they knew about an atomic bomb. Thereafter, Churchill would pursue this matter vigorously, and he sent four agents to the Pentagon the following month, as well as planting British agents within the Manhattan Project. When the Americans were on the way to France on D-Day, the Germans had been given enough advance warning to flood the Continentin Peninsula days ahead of time, so deeply that in many places American paratroopers simply drowned upon landing. Hitler had sent two extra divisions in May of 1944 to the Peninsula sector facing the Americans, claiming to have, quote, fished from the Channel Waters, close quote, a copy of the Americans' field orders. 
Hitler's Paris plan had allowed for a considerable British presence just, just north of where Monty would remain for the duration of the Battle of Normandy, while the Americans would be landed to the south and then told to march on Paris. Hitler mo moved Hitler moved the 1st SS Panzer Division to Paris, but Rommel convinced Ron von Rundstedt to prepare to move away from Paris towards the Normandy beaches, although Schweppenberg and Guderian were firmly against that move because it directly disobeyed Hitler's orders. The British were pretending that the landing would be at Calais, even though no one believed it anywhere. But that deception, called Operation Fortitude, was used as the excuse for the bulk of the German army to be stationed north of Caen, right next to Monty. And after the Americans would be crushed outside Paris, the British would have no choice but to make peace with Hitler. On D-Day, the air forces under British command had dropped their 13,000 pounds of bombs 30 miles well inland from where the, the Germans 30 miles well inland where the Germans were not, instead of onto the Omaha beach defenses in front of the Americans, and the British had known that three German divisions had moved up right behind Omaha beach and reports pinpointing the Germans' new location were sent to Ike first thing in the morning on D-Day, but they did not reach Ike until later due to a clampdown by the British on radio communications in the name of security. Hitler gave his commanders in France a stand-down order on D-Day, allowing the Americans to come on shore so they could march toward Paris, but Rommel was thwarting the stand-down order and causing Hitler no end of grief. The British were supposed to hold a quote-unquote firm bastion up north, and Hitler had specifically declined von Rundstedt's request to move from Paris towards the Normandy beaches. And when finally given permission to prepare to advance, von Rundstedt went farther than Hitler had agreed and got attacked by Allied air power. When Rommel was recalled to Berlin on the 17th of June, he was chastised for failing to obey Hitler's direct orders, and Rommel went back to Normandy and continued to fight on his own initiative, and on the 17th of July, as Rommel was leaving von Rundstedt's headquarters in an open touring car, he was strafed by a lone spitfire and sent to the hospital with three head fractures, and the doctors reported that he would surely die. Three days later, Stauffenberg and his friends tried to kill Hitler in Operation Valkyrie, and Rommel's involvement would never be proven as all the records involved were quickly burned. Monty's Operation Goodwood had been named after the Duke of Richmond's estate, and the Duke was an aircraft designer and a pilot during Hitler's war, and Goodwood ended with the failure of Stauffenberg's 20th of July, 20th of July plot and the Urantia book described the devil's error as, quote, fallacies of personal liberty and fictions of self-determination, close quote. For Heidegger, a conscience presupposes learning a with-knowing, and the British lost 500 tanks during Goodwood, one-third of all they had, along with 4,000 men, and surrender had been in the air. The 20th of July had been the day that the Pope signed the pact with Hitler in 1935, and that meant a lot, that meant a lot to the conspirators, who were for the most part Catholics. And the Americans knew who was behind the Stauffenberg plot on the 20th of July, because some of them had planned to negotiate with the Americans in the surrender and not deal with the British, and they had already contacted Alan Dulles about their plan and told Dulles that Rommel was on their side, but that had been only conjecture on their part, because they were merely counting on Rommel taking orders from them after Hitler was blown up by Stauffenberg's bomb. The plot had been that, after they killed Hitler, the conspirators would save Germany by taking charge of the army, directing all German troops to stand down, and then they would call Stalin with the good news that the war was over. According to Rommel's wife, 
Rommel thought that murdering Hitler would cause civil war in Germany, so Rommel had wanted Hitler put on trial instead of killing him, and for that, Rommel needed to gather enough evidence of Hitler's perfidy negotiating with the British before arresting him. Rommel had wanted the arrest to take place when Hitler was visiting Margival in France on the 17th of June. But Rommel did not think he had enough evidence yet, and he'd been unable to convince half of Hitler's generals that the plan would work. Rommel had swayed von Rundstedt and many others, but because Rommel was not from that class of nobility as the other generals, many of them looked down on him and had been plotting their own separate peace with the British nobles with whom they were more comfortable than in dealing with Rommel. On the 15th of July, Rommel wrote a letter to Hitler urging peace with the Americans, but the letter was delayed in France by the German generals loyal to Rommel, ostensibly in the name of the extreme secrecy being observed in preparation for Operation Valkyrie, and they had wanted to protect Rommel from being mixed up in something he knew nothing about. The letter would not have done any good even if it had reached Hitler's desk, because Churchill had already shown proof to Hitler that Rommel was a traitor. Thousands were arrested and tortured after the 20th of July bomb plot failed, and Rommel's name was mentioned often in the fevered interrogations, and he'd been included on many lists as being a potential future president of Germany. While Rommel had miraculously survived the strafing on the 17th of July, he would be given the opportunity to kill himself on the 14th of October to save his family and friends from Hitler's revenge. Rommel was promised a state funeral with full military honors, along with an announcement that he had succumbed to his injuries due to the strafing of his staff car in Normandy on the 17th of July, which was somewhere near the truth and so Rommel died a hero's death with full honors due his service to the fatherland. When he'd been in command of North Africa, Rommel had not allowed the cleansing of Jews, and he had refused to obey Hitler's orders to execute Jewish POWs, and he had protested to Hitler at Margival about the SS wanting to use the army to kill Jews in France. Rommel had also asked permission from Hitler to punish the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich for having massacred civilians at Orador sur Glane. Rommel had told Hitler not to use Jewish slave labor to build the Atlantic Wall, but they recommend, but recommended Rommel had told Hitler not to use Jewish slave labor to build the Atlantic Wall, but recommended that they hire Frenchmen and pay them good wages, but that did not happen. And had the Germans taken over Egypt and the Holy Land, the fate of the Jews there would have been sealed unless, unless Rommel had been in command. Hitler had survived an, an assassination attempt on the 13th of March in 1943, and the next month the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began on the 19th of April, and a few weeks later the Germans in North Africa surrendered to the British on the 12th of May, four days before the Warsaw Getting Ghetto Uprising ended on the 16th of May in 1943. Mussolini was finished two months later on the 25th of July. And six weeks after that, the Germans came into Italy on the 8th of September in 1943, and one year later, the first V-2 rockets were fired on London, seven days after the Americans survived Monty's 90-day plan in the Normandy Theater, winning command over their own American army so they could march to Paris unmolested. Churchill had flown to Paris on the 16th of May in 1940, the week the Germans marched into France, and Churchill flew over again on the 22nd, and Bilot died the Bilo. Bilo died the next day in the car crash on the 23rd, and Bilo had been the only Frenchman who'd been told the British plan. The following day on the 24th, Hitler flew to Charleville, just a few miles downstream from Sedan, and Hitler's first stop in Paris would be to visit the Paris Opera House. 
During the first week of February in 1945 at the Yalta Conference in the Crimea, when FDR sided heavily with Stalin, the British bombed Dresden three days later. Despite being bombed in air raids since 1942, the industrial heartland of Germany called the Ruhr continued to produce war, materi war materiel for the German army right up until the last days of the war. After each raid, it had cleared the rubble, patched the damage, and gone back into production. Although air eventually hurt the Ruhr, it had failed to destroy it. Without the Ruhr, Germany would be unable to support its armies in the field. Although a, ro a road running east from Cologne offered the shortest route, route, we would prefer to make Frankfurt the main U.S. effort and complete our encirclement when the Ruhr pocket was closed around more than 300,000 troops of Modal's army group. Bradley, page 413 and 15. Modal was not the only senior soldier sticking his head in the sand that day. Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery still believed that he, his friends in the British Army and Churchill, could change Eisenhower's mind and reverse the minor flank roll that apparently would soon be allotted to his second British Army. Churchill was indeed trying. That Saturday, 31 March 1945, he wrote to Eisenhower to restate his own preferred course of action. I do not consider myself that Berlin has yet lost its military and certainly not its political significance. The fall of Berlin would have a profound psychological effect on German resistance in every part of the Reich. While Berlin holds out, great masses of Germans will feel it their duty to go down fighting. Therefore I should greatly prefer persistence in the plan on which we crossed the Rhine, namely that the Ninth U.S. Army should march with the 21st Army Group to the Elba and beyond Berlin. This would not in any way, this would not be in any way inconsistent with the great central thrust which you are now so rightly developing as the result of brilliant operations of your armies south of the Ruhr. It only shifts the weight of one army to the northern flank, and this avoids the relegation of His Majesty's forces to an unexpected restricted sphere. But Brooke, the dour Ulsterman, did not feel that Churchill's flowery compliments would work. Despite all their efforts, the British failed to make Eisenhower change his mind. The die was cast. Montgomery was out of the running, and Bradley was in sole charge now. A few days later, the Ninth Army would come under Bradley's command, and he would become the first American general ever to command four U.S. armies in the field, just under one and a half million U.S. soldiers. Bradley's wishes were now paramount. What else can, how else can one explain what happened as dusk fell on that Saturday? Collins was worried they were thinly spread out, boxing in a whole German army group. Besides, there was an escape route open route. Besides, there was an escape route open to the Germans west of Paderborn on the north face of the Ruhr. This was on the Ninth Army's front, quote, which, as far as I then knew, was still under Montgomery's control. Close quote. Collins reco recalled long after the war. So he now took a step which was eloquent testimony to the toughness of the SS resistance south of Paderborn, and also to the fact that he realized Montgomery's power was on the wane. As he later admitted himself, he now, quote, went outside normal command channels, close quote, just as Eisenhower had caused a rumpus in the British camp on 28 March by addressing Stalin, the head of another state, without reference to his political masters in Washington. Collins now approached the head of another army, the U.S. Ninth, without approaching Montgomery through channels first. Collins and General William Simpson, the head of the U.S. Ninth Army, knew each other well, of course. Simpson agreed to do what Lightning Joe requested. He'd switch the second armor from the Beckham area and direct it to Lipstadt. And that was that. Collins had made an unprecedented move. Parenthesis, channels of communication were as strict in the American army as they were in the British, close parenthesis. And now Simpson did something equally significant. 
he ordered General White, commander of the 2nd Armored Division, to attack towards Lipstadt without consulting Monty. As Churchill was to comment ruefully when he realized that the future in Germany now lay now in American hands, quote, there is only one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that is fighting without them, close quote. The Battle of the Rear Pocket, April 1945 by Leo Kessler, Chelsea, Michigan, Scarborough House Publishers, 1989, page 99 to 102. And with that, the V-2 rockets immediately stopped falling on London. Paderborn was where the Pope had fled in 799 A.D. to find safe refuge with refuge with Paderborn was where the Pope had fled in 799 A.D. to find safe refuge refuge with Charlemagne's army and the Pope had been attacked on the 25th of April but was saved by Charlemagne and stayed with him in Paderborn for 90 days and after saving the Pope and restoring him to his proper place in Rome Charlemagne had come back to also save England Paderborn had been where the German pharmacist Friedrich Wilhelm Adam Surturner first distilled morphine from opium in 1804, and Surturner then moved to Hamelin in 1822, where he spent the next two decades experimenting with his morphine. And Hamelin was where the story about the Pied Piper had come from. The Pied Piper was hired to lure rats away from town with his magic pipe. And when the townsfolk refused to pay him, the Pied Piper used his magic pipe to lure away their children, and aerial bombing would destroy 85% of Paderborn after Monty was marginalized away from the Americans' conclusion to Hitler's war. Now the great race was on. It was Sunday, 1 April, 1945, April Fool's Day. Early this morning, General Hins, commander of the Hell on Wheels, ordered his combat command B to start rolling toward Lipstadt to link up with the First Army. The Americans' progress was slow, however, hampered by thousands of refugees streaming northwest, streaming southwest, and by smaller groups of sullen men in field gray looking for someone to surrender to. Collins was desperate to achieve the link up on this Sunday to get on with the business of winning the war without interference from the top brass. Now it was dawn, the morning was bright and warm, the tanks and half-tracks rattled up the dead straight roads, past orchards that were full of peach and cherry trees, heavy with premature blossom, a bright pink and white, through little villages that had been untouched by the war, past churches where the bells were pealing, calling the faithful Catholics to Mass. It was Easter, after all. The Battle of the Ruhr Pocket, page 106-7. When Zukov had launched his offensive against the Germans and reached the outskirts of Warsaw on the 1st of September in 1944, the Poles had revolted against the Germans, thinking that the Allies would come to their aid. But the Allies had been busy elsewhere. Because the Russian advance towards Germany stopped there to await the outcome of British operations in the Normandy theater, having been informed in fine detail by Kim Philby about Operation Queen, by the time Zukov entered Warsaw, the Nazis had destroyed the city block by block. The British wanted to fly humanitarian aid into Warsaw, but the Russians knew better than to let that happen, and Stalin told the British to step up their part of Hitler's war instead, since it had been Britain's pact with Poland that had started this whole bloody mess in the first place, and Stalin told the Brits that from then on they should stay the hell out of Poland. Russia had once supplied wheat to the rest of Europe, and in January of 1917, the Germans started full submarine warfare against the British, and in his introduction to In Flanders Fields, J.F.C. Fuller said that in the Great War, Britain should have stuck to the naval blockade and just waited for Germany to starve, but the Americans, specifically Hoover, had been feeding the Germans. The U-boats had been winning that year, and in April of 1917, 
One out of every four ships sailing for Britain never returned, and by September the system of convoys was letting eleven out of twelve cross the Atlantic Passage unharmed, while ninety-eight percent of the sunken ones had sailed outside a convoy. On the 27th of June in 1942, convoy PQ-17 under British command sailed from Iceland bound for Archangelsk, and the British radioed to the convoy that the Germans had learned their location and the ships were ordered to scatter. The Luftwaffe, along with U-boats, sank 24 of the 35 ships in convoy PQ-17, and the remaining 11 reached the Russian port where they would declare that delivering supplies to the Russians through the Baltic Sea was simply too hazardous to undertake in the future. Six of the surviving ships had used a sextant and the Times World Geographic pocketbook to sail north to the Arctic ice pack, and there they stopped their engines and banked their fires, and they painted their vessels white and covered their decks with white sheets, and they loaded the main guns of the Sherman tanks that were parked on their decks. After waiting for two weeks until the danger had passed, they continued to their destination and were able to deliver one-third of the total freight that had been loaded on board the original convoy. It took two months for convoy PQ-18 to try again, and this time they went with a covering escort for each of the merchant ships headed towards Archangelsk and in the meantime the British were allowed to withdraw from the effort to supply the Russians through the Baltic Sea and were able to put the totality of their allied resources towards supplying Malta and concentrating on their plans at El Alamein. Convoy PQ-18 arrived on time, even though the Germans had followed their every move and had attacked them with bombers, torpedo bombers, U-boats, and mines, and 13 of the 40 ships in convoy PQ-18 were sunk, while the Americans destroyed four U-boats and shot down 44 German aircraft. At the end of the journey, the convoy had to endure a severe storm at sea during which several, several ships ran aground and unloading took an entire month in October of 1942 while the Americans were successfully landing in North Africa. After returning to Germany from Dunkirk in 1940, Hitler had been able to shift his armies in France to the east to fight Russia, and during the Great War the Germans had failed to get the Russian Serbs out of Yugoslavia, and Russia still had its double eagle eye on Constantinople. 30 April 1944. The usual early start and back to work again refreshed by a week away, but with a great disinclination to start work again! Exclamation point. A long COS chief of staff meeting and an unpleasant cabinet with Winston in a bad mood. In spite of the fact that Alex had made the greatest advance he had yet brought off, he was abused for not having taken Trieste! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! War Diaries, Allenbrook, page 685. In March of 1935, six months before the Nuremberg Laws were passed in Germany, the last surviving member of the Donner Party, the Breen's youngest daughter Isabella, died. And the month after Hitler's war started in Poland in 1939, the AAs in New Jersey rented the first facility where AA did not meet in private homes. Had the Jews not harassed and denigrated and persecuted Jesus, he would have remained just another good Jewish boy wandering around the countryside looking for work. And the rail railroads leading to the extermination camps had not been bombed during Hitler's war, because those railroads would be needed when the British separate peace went through as the British army joined with the Germans to fight Stalin's Russia. Synthetic fuel at the beginning of 1944 had been supplying over half the total gasoline used by Germany, and supplied almost all of its aviation fuel, and the synthetic gasoline plants at Auschwitz were producing both synthetic fuel and synthetic rubber, and those facilities were finally bombed in the spring of 1945 when there was no longer any hope of Germany beating Russia after the Americans had found triumph in, in invading England. In Normandy, at 
the time of the Battle of the Bulge, it had been hoped that the Germans would see the urgency in going after the Americans' fuel dumps, especially the enormous gasoline storage depot at Liège or Lutich in the German. And Liège was on the Meuse River a mere twenty miles west of Malmedy, and Liège had been occupied by the Germans for the entire duration of the Great War. The month after the bulge failed, FDR su suggested to Churchill at Yalta in the Crimea in February of 1945 that Russia be, giving, be given a warm water port at Darin, or Port Arthur in the English, to compensate the motherland for having fought the Nazis, but Churchill just ignored him. Howard Hughes had made a movie called Hell's Angels in 1930 that was about German and English friends separated from each other by the Great War, and the Hell's Angels during Hitler's war were the 358th Bomber Squadron, and the Hell's Angels were allowed to keep their bomber jackets at the end of Hitler's war, and those leather flight jackets became the uniform of choice for protection while riding motorcycles. With an apostrophe, Hell's Angels meant angels belonging to Hell, but the real name was just Hell's Angels with no apostrophe, and that meant angels among all these Hells. And after Hitler's war, America and England remained two brothers born of a common language, with the second ruling the firstborn.